Hello everyone. So in this free lecture tutorial, what we're going to do is we're going to bridge the gap between what we learned in chapter four about atomic structure and starting to turn our attention towards the formation of compounds and obviously eventually chemical reactions. And so if you recall what we learned in chapter four at the very end, basically we went over Rutherford's model of the atom, which again, as I've mentioned before, is not the final model of the atom that is considered to be correct in modern times, but it's a simple model and it helps us to understand what goes on in chemical reactions. And so if you recall from Rutherford's model, basically what we learned was that in the nucleus there are two or three subatomic particles. There are the protons and there are the neutrons. But outside of the nucleus we have the third subatomic particle which would be the electrons. Now, again, if we consider the way the atom looks, when atoms interact to form compounds, it would be extremely unlikely for the protons and neutrons to get involved in that process, since again, they're sort of tucked away in here inside the nucleus, whereas outside of the nucleus, you have all of these electrons swirling around, and so it's much more likely that it's the electrons that are involved in chemical reactions, and indeed, that turns out to be the case. And specifically, not only the electrons in general, but those electrons that are furthest from the nucleus. And if you recall, we briefly touched on that when we were discussing chapter four. Those electrons that are furthest from the nucleus are referred to as valence electrons. Okay? And so, when we consider the behavior of these valence electrons, then once we get good at determining what these valence electrons do within certain chemical processes, then we start to understand chemical reactions a whole lot better. And the first sort of guiding principle that's going to help us to understand what these valence electrons do within chemical reactions is this concept of the octet rule. Now, the octet rule basically just says that when atoms form chemical bonds during chemical reactions to form compounds, basically this will happen so that the atom ends up with eight valence electrons. Because, again, we're going to learn in this chapter and also in subsequent chapters that some atoms have eight valence electrons naturally within their structure, but most atoms do not. And so those atoms that have eight valence electrons in their structure happen to be the noble gases. And so atoms will try to end up with eight valence electrons to take up the same configuration as their closest noble gas in the periodic table by either gaining or losing electrons or by sharing electrons. So that is true primarily, okay, for most elements and for most atoms but it's not true of all of them. They have, there are certain exceptions to the octet rule. Now, the first exception I'll speak about has to do with the fact that if we take a look at the first period in the periodic table, so basically if we're looking at period one, the noble gas in the first period is helium. Now, if we take a closer look at helium's atomic number, we know that helium has an atomic number of two, which means it has two protons in its nucleus. And as we learned in chapter four as well, since atoms are neutral, that means that it also must have two electrons in its structure. And for helium, those two electrons are both considered valence electrons. So those elements that are somewhat close to helium in the periodic table will actually take up helium's noble gas configuration, such as hydrogen, lithium, beryllium, and boron. So when these atoms undergo reactions, then they will typically end up with two valence electrons because that would actually be the configuration of their nearest noble gas. And so that's the first exception to the octet rule. Again, elements like hydrogen, lithium, beryllium, and boron, okay, because of, again, helium having two valence electrons. 
Okay, the other exception, so that's exception number one, exception number two that we'll speak about are the transition metals. Now, when we discuss electron configurations a little bit later during the school year, it'll make better sense why the transition metals don't necessarily follow the octet rule. The structure in which the electrons for the transition metals exist, this structure is a little bit more complicated and it allows for electrons to do something different than what the octet rule would allow. And so when we get into that topic, we'll discuss it in greater detail. But essentially what we're going to do to start the chapter, sort of incorporating this new concept of the octet rule and keeping track of the valence electrons, is we're going to be looking at ionic bonding first, and then we're going to take a look at covalent bonding after that. Now, regardless of what type of bonding we're going to be discussing, a fundamental skill that you're going to need is to be able to determine the number of valence electrons, particularly for those elements in the main group. Now, if you recall, I did mention briefly in our discussion of chapter three, when we were discussing the periodic table, that the main group is considered those elements in groups 1 and 2 and groups 13 through 18. And so I'm going to go and put in an additional row right here by hand in this periodic table on this slide that I'm going to use to write in the number of valence electrons for those elements in the main group. And I'll go ahead and highlight those main group numbers just so we're clear what group we are discussing. Okay, so as it turns out there are two rules that are similar to each other but slightly different from each other regarding the main group elements. Now for groups one and two the group number will equal the number of valence electrons. Okay. However, for groups 13 through 18, it's a little bit different. Here, I'm going to have to take the group number and subtract 10 from it. And that will give me the number of valence electrons for these groups. And so applying those rules, those elements in group 1, since the group number would equal the number of valence electrons, they have 1 valence electron. Those elements in group 2 would have 2 valence electrons because again the group number equals the number of valence electrons for those two groups. Scooting over to group 13, now the rule is a little bit different. I have to take the group number, which is 13, and subtract 10. So 13 minus 10 is 3, so that's the number of valence electrons in the elements in group 3. And so applying that same rule for groups 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, that would mean that those groups have 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 valence electrons respectively. And so, as we were saying, the octet rule says that all atoms, or most atoms, since again we did acknowledge that there are exceptions, they try to get the same number of valence electrons as the noble gases. So that means that most atoms would like to have eight valence electrons. Okay, so let's try and apply that. And the way we're going to apply that is we're going to try and predict so we're going to try and predict the most commonly formed ion for a few elements okay and for our first example let's take sodium okay now sodium is here in the periodic table. Now the closest noble gas to sodium would be neon. Now neon, as we said, has eight valence electrons. And sodium 
has one valence electron. So if sodium is going to form an ion, its options are to either gain electrons or lose. If it gains electrons, then basically that would mean that I would have to go and add to the 11 electrons that already exist in sodium. If I were to allow sodium to gain electrons, then basically it would be gaining electrons such that it would end up with 12 electrons, or if it gained one more electron, then it would gain to get 13 electrons, or gain to get 14, and so on. And as you can see, if I allow sodium to gain electrons, then basically it's moving in the direction opposite to getting to neon, which is its closest noble gas. Instead, it would be moving to argon, which is actually a further noble gas than neon. And so as a result, we can conclude that sodium is not going to want to gain electrons. Instead, if sodium is going to achieve the same configuration as neon, then basically what that would have to mean is that it's going to have to lose this valence electron so that it would have eight valence electrons and neon's configuration. So because of that, sodium is going to be more likely to lose one electron. If an atom loses electrons, then basically it's going to pick up a positive charge because it's losing negative charge. Since I only lost one electron, then that charge would be one plus, or one positive charge. I would then write the formula of the sodium ion as Na and indicate the charge in the upper right hand corner of the symbol. If I were going to name the ion, we normally name these types of ions which are positively charged. These ions are called cations. We name them by just taking the element name. So this would be referred to as sodium. Or if we were going to give it a more thorough name, it would be sodium cation. Now, let's take a different element. Let's take a nonmetal, something from groups 13 through 18. Let's have a look at nitrogen. Okay, so here's nitrogen in the periodic table right here. Now, its nearest noble gas would also be neon. All right, now, in order for it to achieve neon's configuration, based on the rules we just learned, nitrogen's in group 15, so it has five valence electrons. Neon has eight valence electrons. If I want nitrogen to get the same number of valence electrons as neon, then I would have to add three valence electrons to nitrogen structure. So that would give us the eight valence electrons we're looking for. So nitrogen would have to gain three electrons. That would make its ion have a negative charge. But not just one negative charge, there should be three because I had to gain three electrons. So the charge for that ion would be 3 minus. So that would make the symbol for the ion N 3 minus. And so to name a negative ion, and these negative ions are referred to as anions, then I would have to start with the name of the element, nitrogen. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to chop off the ending of the name and instead, I'm going to add in the suffix I-D-E. So we would call this ion the nitride anion. Okay, let's do one more. All right, suppose that I want to consider calcium. Okay, calcium, since it's in group two, it would have two valence electrons but its nearest noble gas would be argon. In order for calcium to get the eight valence electrons in its configuration so that it mimics argon's configuration, it would have to lose the two valence electrons that it currently has. And so that would mean that for calcium, I would lose two valence electrons if I'm losing electrons, then that's going to give my ion a positive charge. 
there would be two positive charges because I'm losing two electrons. The symbol would be the calcium symbol and two plus, and since again we're naming a cation, then this would be considered the calcium cation. So I've given you some more examples where you could write out ionic formulas just to sort of get you warmed up to these concepts. Try that, and then we'll come in tomorrow and we'll fill out some additional details related to bonding and contrasting ionic bonding with covalent bonding, and we'll actually go and continue to discuss ionic bonding in a little bit greater detail. So again, if there are any questions, feel free to email, and I will see you in class tomorrow.